All right, we're getting Facebook up and running here. Let me just pull it up real fast. All right, guys, we're live on Facebook. Let me get Instagram rolling, and we're going to get this thing kicked off here. Excellent. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. If you're on Facebook right now, Zoom, Instagram, um, I want to welcome you to our Friday night wealth creation course. So every Friday, I do a course on finances. And, and the purpose of this course is to help provide financial literacy, meaning people know about money. People know about money. They understand money. They're able to apply their new understanding of money, and they're able to get results with it, meaning they're able to have more money, have wealth, have less debt, have savings, have investments, have passive income. And ultimately, this whole thing is about financial freedom. Have financial freedom. What does that mean? Right. It means that it means that nobody here likes trading time for money. It means that all of our time, talent, skill, um, beingness as humans is more valuable than a green piece of paper. And it means that the system created of us working and trading time for money for the next 40 years so that we can hopefully live and have fun for the last 20 years of our life is a broken system. Okay, that's that's the purpose of this course is to help people get out of that. Now, if you're joining tonight, a couple things I want to go over. First thing first, understand why you're on this webinar. Okay, if you don't know why you're on this webinar, what's going to happen is this interest that you have in money right now, the interest that I have in money when I first started learning, if you're watching this and you don't understand, if I'm like, all right, cool, this is great, but I don't know why I'm on here and I don't know what I'm going to do with the information, I guarantee if that's me, that information is going to slowly die away over time. That excitement that I have for money, it's going to leave. So it's so important if I'm watching this that I understand why I'm here. What is the purpose of me being on this webinar? What am I trying to learn? What am I trying to apply? Because it's got to be something. Now, the second thing is I've got to have a willingness to learn about money. If I'm watching this, I'm closed-minded. This isn't going to help one bit. I'm, I'm going to turn into a heckler. I'm not going to get results. Uh, and, and it's going to be a waste of my time to be on this webinar tonight. So I need to have a willingness to learn about money. And then thirdly, I need to recognize that there's stuff that I don't know. There's stuff that I don't know. Because if I knew it, I wouldn't be on this webinar trying to figure it out. Okay, so again, I have to actually have a purpose of being here. I have to be willing to learn. I have to realize from a, a place of I don't actually know everything there is to know, and that's why I'm here. And then lastly, and this is going to be my job and responsibility mainly, is, is we're going to stay away from complexity. Okay, we're going to stay away from specialized definitions, words that we don't understand, financial jargon, all of that stuff. We're going to try and avoid that entirely. Now, what I want to get an agreement from you on is if you're watching this tonight and I do go across something that you don't understand, you let me know in the comments. Okay, if I use a term that you don't get, drop it in the comments. I'm looking at it right now. If I use a word that you don't understand, say, hey, what does this mean? Um, this is the Jerry Feta style of this quote, and I want to make sure you guys get it. It's rather blunt, but I'd rather be a dumbass for three seconds while I'm asking a question than be a dumbass for the rest of my life because I never asked. Okay, so don't be ashamed to ask questions. This is a zone of learning. I didn't start where I'm at today. I had to work my way up. I had to learn. It's a lot of work, and I want to help you guys avoid some of the complexity that goes with money tonight. Now, to dive into our course, to dive into our course, if this is your first time watching, my name's Jerry. I'm the owner of a company called Wealth Dynamics. And, and what we do is we help create financially educated and wealthy families who can navigate their economic futures with certainty and help build more prosperous communities around them. Okay, that's the goal. So the purpose of these courses is to provide the education piece. Educated families that, that can build wealth. Okay, so, so again, let's set expectation. If I'm watching this tonight, I'm probably not going to get wealthy from watching a 45-minute webinar. I am going to get information. And if I continue getting the information, then I can start to apply it, okay? And, and if I start applying the information, then I'm going to start getting results with it. Bottom line, okay? So the topic here for tonight is what's the economy going to do? Okay, very big topic we're going to go into. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. There's a lot of not knowing what's going to happen, um, just general fear, just general confusion on the economy. And so we're going to cover tonight what is happening, what's going to happen, what has happened, and how do I take the economy in stride?
when I say the economy, I mean the 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 broad production, the 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 work, the money, the revenue generated in the United States. The economy does not mean the stock market. Okay, the economy does not mean just real estate. The economy is looking at the entire United States people and the production of those businesses and people. Okay. And, and understanding how does it work. Now, the information I'm going to share is very fundamental. It's a basic truth. And if you're able to see that and grasp it, it's going to be very, very helpful for you. But again, it's one of those things like we addressed last week. It's going to disagree with some of the fixed belief systems out there. Some of the, the things that we're emotionally attached to believing are going to get shattered as the byproduct of going over what I'm going to go over tonight. So again, realize, hey, if I don't have results, there's something I don't know. And if there's something that I don't know, I need to realize that and I need to be willing to learn, okay? Like this is real. Liam just posted uh, th another tr 3 trillion stimulus. Guys, JC Penney just filed bankruptcy today. So this is not like some, you know, just hyped up the economy, the sky is falling. I'm not that guy. But what I am telling you is that real businesses are going under, real people are struggling with finances and the country is not in a good spot. Okay, and it's not the first time that, it, that it's happened, okay? So if you guys are on, um, on Instagram, I'm going to post a link here. If you're on Instagram, you're not seeing the slides. There are slides we're going to go over tonight. I posted a link. You can check that link out. That's going to take you to the Zoom meeting. Um, and that way you can actually see a visual of what I'm talking about and get some reality behind it. If you can't click it on Instagram, Instagram does not have a click feature. Then you might have to copy and paste it in the browser. Or just go to my uh, Jerry Feta, and you can see it there as well. So let's go ahead and jump into this, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We're going to talk about um, some very basic fundamentals with the economy. Okay, so this first thing I'm going to talk about is called the wealth transfer scale. And I, I drew this up last week because I wanted to put on paper, how does the economy work? Okay, how does money work? How, when we see the, the market go up, real estate go up, when we see, we see businesses winning, what causes that and why is that happening? And when we see the opposite of, of stocks crashing, real estate not doing well, businesses going under like we're seeing now, what's causing that? Okay, because when I first started studying this, it almost seemed majestic, meaning it was just like poof. And, and I didn't understand why, why things would happen. I didn't understand how any of it worked. I didn't understand what was causing it. And so because of that, I really couldn't have any application or control over it, right? So when we're looking at where we're at today, we're in the middle of a quarantine, okay? Most businesses are just now opening if they're essential. A lot of people haven't been working. I think 26 million filed for unemployment last month. That's insane. Uh, we had a massive stock market crash in, in March, a lot of people lost a lot of money that they haven't rec recovered yet. Uh, we have people defaulting on their mortgages, meaning they're not making their mortgage payments. We have people that aren't paying rent. Um, and, and it really is like this environment of like everything that could be up in the air and, and wrong kind of is. And because of that, like I said, there's a lot of uncertainty. Right. Just, just think if I'm in a position right now, like where I'm the average person, if I'm not working, that makes me uncertain. Because I don't know when I'm getting paid yet. And I probably haven't been stacking up and preparing for something like this. So I probably don't have very much in savings. Just lost money in my retirement account. So there's really nothing I can grab there either. And, and I'm trying to figure out like what's happening next. Okay, I'm at full effect, meaning everything is happening to me. I'm not causing stuff at this point. Everything is happening to me. It's like I'm getting hit over and over and over and over and over right? That causes me to be uncertain. When I'm uncertain, I stop moving. Meaning I don't keep moving forward. I, I grew up in Alaska. In Alaska, we have lakes that freeze over in the, in the wintertime. You can walk on them and drive on them. And I remember when I was probably 16, 17 years old, I was a pizza delivery driver and I was delivering pizza on this road, pitch black, snow fly, and I'm going on the road and I'm driving in my, I had a, a 1997 Chevy tracker. Shout out if any of you guys had a tracker, um, but it's basically this little SUV, right? So I'm flying down the road, pitch black, snow, all of that. And I'm driving and I'm looking out the window and I see the, the surroundings around me start getting higher. Like it, it was almost like the trees started rising and the, the road around me started rising and I didn't know what was going on. So I started to kind of slow down a little bit because I was uncertain. 
I wanted to get an idea of what was happening. I needed to observe my surroundings. The problem was, is I wasn't on a road. I didn't realize at this point in time, I was driving on a frozen lake and the ice was cracking and the ice that I was driving on was slowly sinking into the water. And so the things around me weren't raising. I was actually sinking into the lake as I was driving. And as soon as I realized that, I sped up and hammered the gas pedal so I could get off, get ahead of the ice cracking and get off the lake. Okay, otherwise I would have sunk in a frozen lake in the middle of Alaska in dead winter time, pitch black of night. It would not have been fun, right? And I share that story because economically that's what happens, right? We're going on a track, we're cruising right along, working, you know, enjoying the weekends, having fun, doing the vacation twice a year and life is just great. And all of a sudden things start looking weird. Stock market goes down right? We have this, this, this whole virus happen. We have the quarantines and people start to slow down and stop. It's not wrong. Like that's a natural response. I'm trying to find stable points that I can then identify and try and make sense of what's happening. The problem is, is that we're on that sinking lake. So the amount of time that I stop and slow down is going to put me in a big, big negative position as far as getting off the lake is concerned, as far as making progress and getting into safety. If I stay there and try and check things out, even though it might be justified in my own mind, I'm actually hurting myself. You guys tracking with that? So that's that's important. I've got to get certainty quickly and then I've got to keep going. And that's what tonight is about. So I'm going to flip Instagram around just because I know you guys are going to have such a hard time understanding any of this if I don't flip you here. Okay. So guys, this, this is called the, the, the wealth transfer scale. Okay. When we refer to wealth, this is referring to material wealth, money, possessions, assets, right? And, and so when we refer to, refer to transfer wealth, the assets are going to be moving from one party to another. This, that's that word transfer, right? I think I can, I can draw on this as well as I'm going through. I can. Great. So that word transfer is referring to the money's being moved from one party to another. And then a scale basically is going to be a visual representation of the flows of something. It's going to be an upward, downward, left, right type of scale. And that's what we're seeing. That's what the lines are here. Okay. So on this scale, you're going to see here at the top surplus of currency. Okay. What is currency? Currency is, is the U.S. dollar. It's, it's basically an exchange system. We might refer to it as money. Technically, it's called currency. Okay, It's a medium of exchange. It's what people trade back and forth with each other to, to, to move goods and services from one person to another or from one group to another. So if we have a surplus, it means that we have more currency than is needed. Okay, The opposite scale of that, this is important to understand, the opposite scale of a surplus of currency is a surplus of goods and services. Okay, so think about what happens if I have a bunch of goods and services and there's not a bunch of money in the public for them to go buy my goods and services. Okay, are things gonna be booming? Not really, that, that's why it's downward, right? If I have a bunch of goods and services but I don't have a lot of currency, then the economy starts to slow down. People stop buying prices start to go up initially, and then they start coming down and really like decreasing and going down in value quite a bit because nobody's able to buy stuff. Doesn't matter how much I think my goods and services are worth, I end up having to lower my prices to make it more affordable for everyone else, right? Now, opposite of that, if we have a surplus of currency and we don't have a surplus of goods and services, what happens is we have prices rise. Okay, we have a bunch of a bunch of people buying stuff, and when we buy more and more and more and more, it drives prices up. Okay, so think of that like a seesaw, like a teeter totter. We're either going to have a surplus of currency, meaning a bunch of extra money in the system or in the country, or we're going to have a surplus of goods and services. We're going to have a bunch of things, but not enough money to go buy those things. Okay, that's that's what this is showing. So I want to make sure that that's very simple. Again, if there's questions on this, I want you guys to ask away in the comments because I will answer those. Um, The other thing we have here, this is again, the next part of this is spending. So an economy is made up of of two different components. There's two different sides here. Okay, so we're going to see that we have this side here. 
which is going to be our currency, right? So we have the money in the system and we have the, the, the goods and services in the system. So that's going to be like what's out there in the economy. We have money to spend. We have things to buy, right? The other component is behavior. Are people spending or are people saving, right? Because if I have a bunch of, of currency, it doesn't necessarily mean everyone is spending, okay? So that's, that's I've got to have both components of that. Just like if I have a bunch of goods and services, it doesn't necessarily mean people aren't buying. Okay, so what these are is these typically work inversely of each other. We have a surplus of currency, like here, which typically correlates with increased spending, meaning when there's a lot of money to be spent, people usually spend the money, right? On the flip side, if we have an increase in saving, we usually end up with surplus goods and services. Because if people are saving, they're not spending, and that's going to leave a bunch of extra. We're going to make sure we clearly understand that. So those are going to be kind of like, like polar opposites or parodies of each other. We have a surplus of currency and increased spending, or we may have an increase in saving with a surplus of goods and services. Very basic fundamental economics right here. Okay, and, and I want to make sure we spend plenty of time here because this is not taught in schools. This, is not, this isn't taught in most universities, let alone schools, right? And so what we see is, is we're going to have different times in the economy when these things happen. We're going to have times when there's a lot of money and there's a lot of spending. We just went through that the last decade. Okay, things have been up. Real estate went up, right? Prices went up. There's been a lot of money. It was easy to get loans. It was easy to make money. And, and so we kind of had this zone happening up here, right? And then we had, so we had this zone happening here. And then more recently, now we're seeing this. We're seeing more people are saving, less people are spending. We're seeing that there's more and more goods and services. That's why JC Penney just went out of business. They had more goods and services than they had currency. People weren't spending. So they couldn't stay in business and they couldn't lower their prices down low enough to get people to buy. So they had to go out of business and file bankruptcy. Okay, very, very fundamental stuff we're covering. So what I want to do is I'm going to break this into chunks here. So we just covered that. I'm going to go and just check our questions, see if you guys have any questions on this so far. By the way, if you guys are on Instagram, if you guys are on Instagram, let me know if you guys have questions on any of this. I want to make sure we answer those in the comments. Um, let me just check Facebook and see if we have anything on Facebook. Okay, cool. It, make, it looks like most people are, are getting this. Awesome. I just want to make sure we don't brush over anything and you guys are like, what did he just say? Um, all right, so let's go back here to this chart now. Let me flip you guys back around Instagram. <clears throat> Great. Now, the surplus of currency and increased spending could be what we call inflation. Okay, inflation, right? We know that is inflation. Inflation means we have lots of currency and we have lots of spending. Just to simplify things, increased spending, surplus of currency equals inflation, vice versa. Inflation equals surplus currency, increased spending. So when you guys are watching the news, you watch CNBC, any of that stuff where they say, hey, inflation is happening, that means there's lots of currency in the system and there's a lot of people spending money and that's driving prices up. Now, the opposite of that is considered deflation. Okay, deflation right here. <clears throat> deflation means we have a surplus in goods and services, and it means that we have more saving going on, right? Which means conversely, less money is being spent. There's less money in the system. That's why it's called deflation. Inflation, we're pumping it up. We're getting a lot of money rolling, a lot of velocity, right? And we go down here, deflation, we're reducing it. We're getting more people saving. We have more goods and services. There's less money flowing. There's less velocity. Okay, so, so this is the basics of what we're covering here. This is how an economy functions. It doesn't matter whether it's the United States, China, Russia, it doesn't matter. All of them operate this way. Um, and, and it's a very fundamental thing that we want to understand. Okay, now the next component of this, and I'm going to pop my video out of the way here because there's going to be some, some uh, extra data that I want to cover. Now, the next thing to cover here are there's some other, there's some other areas that we're going to see as more of like symptoms. 
Do you guys understand there's like the root cause, the thing that's making something happen, but then there's the symptom, the phenomena that we might see or observe on the outside, okay? So things that we're gonna watch for, we're gonna watch for taxes. We're gonna watch for interest rates, okay? We're gonna watch for purchasing power. We're gonna watch for investment opportunities. These are all things we're paying attention to as this happens, okay? So check this out. Let me just clear these terms up for you guys. Purchasing power is the first one. Oh, dope. We got a highlighter too, guys. This thing is sick. So we got purchasing power, right? What is purchasing power? Purchasing power literally refers to how much money can my money buy? How much, how much value and goods and services can my money buy, right? So if I have really high purchasing power, it means that my money can buy a lot of things. Okay. If I have really low purchasing power, it means that my money can't buy a lot of things. I can buy very little with my money. Who, who just last week saw gas go down to like a buck 50, right? My purchasing power went up. I could buy more gas. Okay. Correlating, it means prices went down. So the lower prices are the higher purchasing power I have. The higher prices are the lower my purchasing power. Gas goes up to $4 a gallon. I can't buy as much. I just lost purchasing power. Okay, so that's all it's referring to that really correlates with pricing. How much can my money buy, right? The next thing is taxes, mostly referring to income tax, but there's a lot of different taxes out there. There's income tax, there's property tax, there's different taxes that we pay. And so we want to watch taxes during this as well. So, so we're going to see again, inflation, deflation, how does that play along with taxes, Right. How much of my money is the government trying to take from me? Okay. So they're going to either try and take a lot because they think I have a lot, or they're going to take a little because they don't think I have very much and they want to have me flowing more money into the system. And so they're going to incentivize me to by reducing my taxes. These are all mechanism, guys. Same thing. We have over here interest rates. Okay. Interest rates. When I borrow money, how much does it cost? Okay. How much does this cost? Is it, is it a high interest rate? Like who's financed the car or mortgage before? Most of us, right? So, so if I go finance, I think my first car I financed, my interest rate was like 9%. Okay, interest rates incentivize spending. Meaning if, if they raise interest rates, they're trying to prevent me from spending money. When I was 18 and financed my first car, they didn't like me having a, a $10,000 loan with them because it's risky and I'm 18. So they said, hey, we're gonna charge a crazy high interest rate. And if you do it, it's okay for us because we're actually getting paid for our risk, right? So the higher interest rates are, the less incentivized I am to be spending money. They're trying, the, the government, the banks, they're trying to reduce the amount of money that I spent, okay? The lower interest rates are, the more they're trying to get me to spend money. Right. If I can go borrow money at 3% on a mortgage, that means that the government's trying to get me to go buy housing. That means banks want me to have that money. Okay. And then the final one would be investment opportunities. Okay. Based on the economy, what investment opportunities are out there? Okay. What should I be putting my money into? Where should I be investing? What should I be putting it into? What should I be avoiding? What should I be paying attention to? Okay. So again, all of these terms, purchasing power, how much money can I buy? right? How, how much can my money buy? Taxes, how much is the government taking from me? Interest rates, how cheap is it to borrow money? How low is my rate? How high is my rate? And then investment opportunities, where should I be putting my money? Okay. Um, Nexo Valid says, uh, uh, can you save this live when you're done? So Nexo, if you check out the live, we'll be here on Instagram, usually 24 hours after. Um, you can check it out all, up to 24 hours, I think. You can check my YouTube page as well. Um, Bricky's meme says, how do I know when I should invest? I'll answer that in a second. And our terms here. So again, let me just check Facebook. Let me check Zoom really quick. I want to make sure you guys understand this. We're not leaving you in the dust on any questions. If you guys are on Instagram, drop questions in the comments. I will answer them. Okay. Any questions we have on Facebook so far? Brad says not many people are driving very far. That's why gas is cheap. There's a couple other reasons there as well. Uh, Jordan Webb, great to see you. All right, let's see if we have anything on Zoom. 
Good. I don't see any questions on Zoom. And, and guys, I know this is a little choppy. I know I'm breaking this down and going back and forth, but I really want to make sure that I'm not losing you guys as I'm going through this with any of the, the terminology we're going over. So I appreciate your patience as we're going through and, and being willing to allow me to actually stop and answer questions. Okay, cool. So this is what we have so far. We just covered our terms. We had all of this stuff we just talked about, right? The next thing we need to be thinking about, and I'm going to erase our, our ink just to clear things up a little bit. The next thing we need to be thinking about is what happens in each of these zones, right? So, so we have, again, surplus of currency, increased spending. That's inflation, right? That means that prices are going up. We have a lot of money in the system. We have increased spending. That is going to be noticed by higher prices. You guys see that? of inflation, we're going to have higher prices. So when I start seeing prices go up, that means that we're in a period of inflation. Very important to know that. I'm going to use green just because that's a color we haven't used yet. Okay. So I'm going to see higher prices during a period of inflation. So when I start seeing that, that's where I know inflation is currently happening. Okay. The other thing I'm going to see during a period of inflation is that taxes are going to go up. Okay. So if I'm in inflation, Taxes are going to go up. Prices are going to go up. Okay. And, and again, the re reason behind a lot of money and there's a lot of spending, that's going to drive prices up. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so the prices go up because more there's more there's more buying happening in the marketplace. There's more transactions happening. Taxes go up as well because the government, they basically skim the cream off the top. I don't know how to say this politically correct. Um, they're, they basically wait for people to produce it and then just steal it. So they skim it off the top. So when they see a high surplus, that's where they're going to go in and get paid. Okay, so they're looking at, okay, spending is up. There's a lot of money in the economy. We're going to go raise taxes now. We're going to get paid on this. Okay, that's, that's the basics of this. They see prices are up. They see people are doing well. They see we're prop prospering. They see everything is going great. Why not raise taxes? So when I see taxes go up, typically that means that we're in a period of inflation. Okay, the government would not raise taxes if they were worried about it affecting the economy negatively. So you, you better bet if they're raising taxes, they think they have leeway to do it. That's an indicator. Okay, the other thing we're going to see here, we're going to see higher interest rates. Okay, higher interest rates, meaning when I borrow money, it's going to cost me more. Um, right now, interest rates are very low. But if you guys think back to probably December of 2018, they raised interest rates. The, the bank started to bump up mortgage rates bit by bit. And the reason why is the economy is doing well. We have surplus of money, lots of spending. So again, banks earn money off of other people's money. Their logic is, okay, people are spending. We can now insert higher interest rates and start to funnel some of that money back to us. That's where they make their profit. Okay. So again, if we see higher interest rates, that's an indicator that the economy has been doing well and we're in a, we're in a period of inflation. If, if we see this happening, we see this happening, we see this happening, you better bet that we're in an inflationary period. There's lots of currency, lots of spending going on. And guys, the reason I keep hitting this is because repetition creates certainty. Repetition creates mastery. I should, if I'm learning this today, I should be able to take a look at the economy around me, understand exactly what's happening and know where we're at. Okay, if I can't, that means that I, I need to see this more times. I need to have this explained to me more. Okay, this is, this is very, very high level stuff that I'm simplifying for you, but I don't wanna have you take it for granted just because we have pictures and shapes. Um, it really is like fundamental. If you get this, you're set. Okay, like really, really think about it. I, I wanna master this information. Okay, so if I'm looking around, I see higher prices, higher taxes, higher rates, spending is increased, money is, is free and out in the economy, we're currently in a period of inflation. Okay, now in a period of inflation, we're going to typically see two things happen. We're going to see either the inflation continues up, or if it doesn't, the only other thing it could do is go down. Right. So we might also see inflation start coming down. We're going to see inflation start turning into deflation if we have too much of it. Very basics. Okay. 
Now, the other thing that we're focused on here is deflation. Like I mentioned, what does deflation look like? So if deflation is happening, that means that we have lower prices, right? Because again, we have saving rather than spending. So we're here now, we're not here, right? We have surplus of goods and services instead of a surplus of money, meaning there's a lot of supply in the marketplace. There's not a lot of demand. There's a lot of saving going on. There's not a lot of spending. Okay, that causes deflation. Okay, the first thing we're going to see in deflation is that prices start going down. Okay, gas, gas, for example, just dropped, right? So we see prices start going down. Okay, that's, that's the first indicator of deflation. Prices that usually would be high start going down. So we saw gas coming down. By the way, stocks, they operate on prices. When the stock market comes down, that's deflationary. So we just saw that in February. That happened even before oil did. The prices went down on stocks. The other thing we see is we see taxes start going down. Who, who was paying attention to the government? They just, they just extended the tax deadline again. They extended it out to like June. I think now they're extending it out to, to like September. Okay, they're, they're cutting. They're thinking about cutting payroll taxes. They're trying to give benefits because if we lower taxes, then people can go spend more. See, governments don't like deflation. Governments do not like deflation. And I'm going to tell you why in a second, but you have to realize that governments are trying to prevent deflation. They want lots of money. They want lots of spending. They want very high numbers. And if they have all that, then things look great. They can say the country is succeeding. Now, if that's not happening and there's not a lot of money and there's not a lot of spending and people are, are, are not booming, even though the individual is saving, the government looks at that and they say, okay, that's not good. That's deflationary. We need to try and, and get rid of this. We need to try and fix this. They do that by lowering taxes. Okay, the other thing that's going to happen is, again, we're going to see lower interest rates, just like we're seeing now. Okay, banks are reducing interest rates. The Federal Reserve, the, the, the private corporation that runs our, our country's monetary system, they reduce the rates that they loan out to the banks by quite a bit. They're almost at zero right now. Okay. When rates are lower, that's a sign that we're in a deflationary period because the banks are trying to incentivize spending to get people moving and get the economy back up and running. Okay. That's deflationary. And then finally, like, what does this mean to me as an investor is what I'm going to cover next. Boom. What do I invest in? Okay, where do I put my money? If it's inflation, where do I invest? Okay, if we're in an inflationary period, I'm investing in things like loans. Okay, and the reason being is loans are based on interest rates. We just saw interest rates are gonna go up, right? If interest rates are gonna go up, I wanna be a benefactor of that. I wanna take advantage of it. I'm gonna loan my money out. Okay, P I want to actually shout out PK215 just had a great comment. So he says, that makes sense. I feel like that's part of the reasons why they gave everyone that stimulus check because they knew people would spend more. That's exactly it. That is a very smart observation. So what PK is saying is people stopped spending. Money was going away. More people are saving. There's more goods and services. The government saw deflation and they said, hey, let's inject stimulus checks. Let's inject this money into the system because now that's going to cause people to start spending again. And then we'll have a surplus of currency and we'll start getting rid of this deflationary activity. That's the hope of the government. Okay. Now the problem that they're seeing, and this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but since PK brought it up, I'm going to dive into it. The government created a surplus of currency. People didn't spend it. People are still saving. So it didn't work according to plan. Right. Like I said, there's, there's the government manipulating currency, goods, and services, but there's also behavior. We've got to have both sides of it. We might print currency. It doesn't necessarily mean that people started spending it. Right. So, so back to the investing thing. If I'm looking at this right now and I'm looking at, okay, we're in a period, let's say we're in a period of inflation. Where, where do I put my money? Okay. Where do I invest today? I'm looking at higher rates means that I can loan out my money and I can make more money on that loan. 
So I'm looking at loans. I'm looking at, at secured loans, meaning it's backed by a real asset and it's paying me every single month. That's where I'm focused on. Okay. And, and this is even a predictive thing. If I think inflation is about to happen, because here's the deal on loans, guys. This is why this is, I love loans. I love loaning money out. If I'm investing in a loan, rates went high, right? So I'm earning a lot of interest on my loan. Let's say I'm able to, I'm able to make 12% on my loan. Okay. Now the other thing I'm looking at is prices went high, right? So when I loaned that money out, whatever I loaned it for probably is going to go up in value. If I loan, if I loan out on a piece of real estate and we're having inflation, the price of that real estate is going to go up, meaning my collateral on this loan is becoming exponentially more valuable. I loaned my money out and they couldn't pay me and I have to foreclose and take that piece of collateral back. I'm able to make a lot of money on that because the price went up. If I foreclose, I'm getting the value of it. The price went up. Okay. And if they don't default, I'm making my a very high interest rate. Right. So, so those are, those are things I'm looking at here. Now, the other factor on this is going to be, what if we hit deflation? Right. What if we go into deflation? Where do I put my money at that point in time? So let's say we go into deflation. Savings go up. Goods and services are, are up. Money is not flowing. People are not spending. And we see where do I invest? Acquisitions. That's where I'm looking at in deflation. I'm buying things. The reason I'm buying things is number one, prices went down. I have lower prices. Right. So if prices went down, then I want to buy right now because I have a very low cost of acquisition. Also, if I need to borrow money to acquire, my rates are also lower. Do you guys see that? So if I'm trying to buy things, the prices are dropping. And if I have to borrow money to buy it, my interest rates are going to be very cheap. Okay, if I'm lending during this period, it's going to be tough for me to do lending as, as well as I could have during an inflationary period because my interest rates have dropped. My rates are going down. It's harder for me to say, hey, give me 12%. Okay, so, so these are, again, just different things we're looking at, different opportunities. Um, Kyle says, when someone first, get, first gets into investing, where should you start? How much should you put out? Um, Kyle, I would say don't put out anything until you've invested in your own education. So until you really know this stuff, don't feel an urge to invest. Don't feel like you have to, okay? It's, it's important to understand what you're investing in. So, so guys, just to, just to kind of summarize, if we're in a period of inflation where prices are high, I'm looking at loans. That's where I'm trying to put money, okay? If we're in a period of def deflation right now, prices have gone down, as we can see here. Now I'm looking at acquiring. I'm looking at buying things that are on sale. Okay, which kind of poses the question of where are we at today? So let's talk about that. Where are we at today? Okay, so today we're in a very weird spot. I'm, I'll tell you guys that much. Today we have a surplus of currency. Let me just get my pen up and running here. We have a surplus of currency. Almost got it. Pen, there we go. Surplus of currency. Okay, but we don't have increased spending. Okay, so we have a surplus of currency. We have a little bit of increased savings and we have a lot of increased goods and services. Okay, this is, this is called stagflation, meaning it's stagnant, right? We, before the COVID-19, before this whole shutdown happened, we were most definitely in a period of inflation. Okay, we were totally in a period of inflation. Prices were up. Real estate was, an, as an, was at an all-time high. Stock market was at an all-time high. Unemployment was low. People were spending. People were being frivolous with money. And what happened is we had a bump, right? We started to go down. Now, the government said, no, we can't have that bump. We need to get rid of it. Let's go increase the amount of currency in the system to try and incentivize spending. Now, the problem is, is we are all staying home. We're not out spending that money right now. We, we're not going to work. Like we're staying home. We can't go to the mall. JC Penney's is shutting down because nobody can go shop there for the last eight weeks, right? So we have one of the elements of inflation 
but we have all of the other elements of deflation. So it's kind of this weird mix of both. That's why it's called stagflation. It's got some of the indicators. It's almost teetering. It hasn't made a decision on which way it's going to go, right? If we look at these indicators, um, prices right now have not gone up. So prices are low, right? Taxes are low, right? Interest rates are low, okay? But things aren't on sale yet. I can't go buy real estate for 50 cents on the dollar. Okay, some asset classes went down, some didn't, a lot of them are coming back up. So, so this again is not a blanket statement of, oh, we're in inflation, I should loan my money out, or oh, there's some deflationary characteristics, I, go to, I better go buy things. I still have to use common sense and try and figure out through this system, where is everything at, right? So really quick, Let's flip this back around. Hi, guys. Um, I want to just check out and just see if there's any questions again before we move on to our next segment. If you guys have questions, again, leave them in the comments on Zoom. Leave them in the comments on Facebook. Ask them here on Instagram. I'm very happy to answer your questions. All right, looks like we do have some questions on Facebook. All right, so Facebook, we have... Liam Chase says the government is trying to stop deflation by printing money, but don't realize they can't control value. Marcy Barker said most of her credit card with hers. So Marcy is exactly on track. That's called a deflationary activity. The government sent out stimulus money. I can't tell you how many people that I know that either paid off debt, saved it, or they bought gold and silver. Okay. So, so that's a deflationary characteristic. Um, Marcy said, what if the government told everyone they had to spend it or else? That would kind of be like communism, um, which we're not far from, as I can see. But uh, the government can't really make someone spend money. They could try and incentivize them to by causing inflation, like making the money go down in value so people realize, oh, it's going down. I better spend it before it's no longer valuable. Um, Eric Whitaker, he says... What is the point of the vicious cycle of printing money? What is the breaking point of the vicious cycle of printing money to stimulate the economy? Eric, that's a really good question. I'll answer that in a second. Um, Nick Palmer says, do you think the government hopes that the loans will cause sort of a jump uh, start once things are back open? So Nick, that's exactly what the government's hoping for. So, so what we're talking about is the stimulus money, right? Bunch of people got stimulus money. They got checks. They got loans. Um, the government's hoping people go spend that. They're hoping people go spend that because if people go spend that, that means the economy is doing well again, okay? Um, Steve says he's invested in personal development. That's a good move, Steve. That's awesome. All right, Instagram. Freddie says, uh, would it be smart to get in debt since interest is at an all-time low? Um, I would never say it's smart to get in debt just for the sake of interest rates being low. If I have a particular asset and I know that that asset is going to pay and I have historical proof that it has paid for over the last three to five years consistently and I know how to control it if it doesn't, um, then I would borrow money to buy that asset. But I wouldn't just arbitrarily buy the asset just because interest rates are low. And I wouldn't just get loans hoping that I could find somewhere to place them. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of the loans that are coming out, like the SBA loans, have very tight regulations on what they can and cannot be used for. So if I borrow that money and I use it for something that it's not supposed to be used for, that is considered fraud. And I would be probably faced with prison time, fines, having to pay it back, paying taxes, whatever it might be. Okay. Um, all right. So let's jump into our next part of the slide here. All right, Instagram, I'll flip you guys back around. Instagram is going to get motion sickness tonight. I'm doing so much back and forth. Now, here's the problem. <clears throat> this is the problem we have to solve. This is, this is, again, wealth, freedom, right? So if I'm trying to build wealth, I'm looking at how do I make money in these various zones, right? Now, we have to realize that the government is not necessarily looking at how does Jerry make money during these times. They're not looking at how do you make money during these times. They look at they look at what are we going to make money on during these times, right? So during a time of inflation, this is known as collectivism. Okay, I'm gonna get a little bit deep with you guys here, collectivism. Collectivism, and then in a deflation period, this is known as individualism. Okay, what I wanna point out here, guys, 
is when we have increased spending and increased currency, that is not good for the individual. That means that the individual has to pay higher prices. Taxes. That means that the individual is going to pay right now. We're just talking about freedoms and, and people being able to survive economically. So when we lease and there's lots of spending, that is not good for the individual. Okay, now that is good for the group, right? That is good for the group, but who is the group? That's this, that's this very vague thing, right? Now, when we have increased savings, that's very good for the individual. It's not good for the group, but it's very good for the individual. Okay, when we have a surplus of goods and services, that's also very good for the individual, right? So what happens is during deflation, even though it's made out to be this very nasty zom like zombie apocalypse type thing, prices go down. I like it when prices go down, okay? My taxes go down. I like it when my taxes go down. Interest rates go down. I can borrow money more cheaply. I like it when interest rates go down. See, for me personally, I would prefer deflation. I would prefer lower, lower prices. I would prefer lower taxes. I would prefer lower interest rates. I would be able to go buy more things, okay? But that's not good for the group, the group, quote unquote. We still haven't defined who is the group, okay? So I'm about to blow your mind with this. Collectivism, like we're talking about up top, is when wealth is transferred from those who do not have it to those who do have it. Let me repeat that again. Collectivism is wealth being transferred from those who do not have it to those who do have it, right? When surplus currency happens and prices go up, right? Surplus currency happens, prices go up. Who, who gets the better deal on that? The guy buying it or the guy selling it? The guy selling it, the guy buying it has to pay more money for the same stuff. It's not a good deal for the guy buying it. Who is the guy selling it? Well, the guy selling it is someone like, you know, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, like these guys that own products, Elon Musk, like we're going and buying from these guys, these people, right? So prices go up. That's good for them. Again, collectivism is wealth transfer from those who do. It's not the wealthy guy. He's the guy that doesn't have the wealth. He's buying it from the wealthy guy at higher prices because there's a surplus of currency and increased spending causing the prices to go up. Okay, so that's wealth being transferred from those who do not have it to those who do already have it by means of government, spending, borrowing, taxation, and inflation. Those are mechanisms to transfer wealth. Guys, this is why this is called the, the, the wealth transfer scale. When we have periods of inflation, when the government starts loaning out money, when they start printing, when they start doing stimulus checks, they are taking money from you and I to put it in the pockets of the government and the super wealthy. That's exactly what inflation is, right? Who makes money on interest rates? The guy borrowing the money or the guy loaning the money? The guy loaning it, right? So, so why would it be beneficial for rates to go up? It wouldn't. The guy loaning the money is the one that makes it. He gets it from the guy borrowing it, okay? Taxes going up. Who does that benefit, right? Does that benefit me or does that benefit the government? That benefits the government, okay? Inflation is 100% collectivism. Collectivism is, is a form of socialism. I don't want to get political in this. It's just it is what it is, okay? We're taking money from those who don't have to pad the pockets of those who do have. Individualism at the bottom is where we have deflationary activities. Let me give you guys a better circle there. Okay, we have deflationary activities, right? Wealth being transferred from those who do not have it or from those who do have it to those who do not have it by means of supply and demand, bubbles, economic crashes and corrections. Guys, Deflation is when wealth changes hands from those who currently have it and those who don't have the opportunity to have it. Why? In the world, we prevent deflation. Okay, because when deflation happens, we just looked at prices go down. We just looked at taxes go down. We just looked at interest rates go down. I now have the power as the individual to go build wealth for myself that I didn't have when we had inflation.
Okay, this this is so important. If I understand this, I can predict the economy. I can look at where are we at right now? Which of these indicators am I seeing? Where does that align with where we're at today? And what does that mean for my future? Right now, speak enough prediction. This is the next scale here. I'm going to I'm going to do this one quickly. <clears throat> Okay, so on this, we have, again, the same categories, purchasing power, taxes, interest rates, military activity. Um, this is the scale of economic prediction. So the scale we just looked at is wealth transfer, the transference of wealth. This scale is how do I predict what's coming next, okay? So if we have lower prices, if we have lower taxes, if we have lower rates, if we start going to war, that's inflationary activity. Okay, those are all mechanisms that, that the powers at B use to build inflationary activity. So when I'm seeing prices go up, when I'm seeing taxes go lower, when I'm seeing rates happen, when I see threats of war, I, that's inflationary activity. Now, again, why would a government cause inflationary activity? Why would banks and corporations cause inflationary activity? What are they trying to avoid? Well, they're trying to avoid deflation. So if I'm seeing these types of things come up, that means that we're currently in an era of deflationary activity and the government is trying to cause inflation. Banks are trying to cause inflation, right? So banks and governments will attempt to cause inflation by increasing the supply of money, lowering interest rates and incentivizing spending. If this happens, it is a sign that we are either in or near deflation. Okay, that's, that's the thing that we're looking at. So right now, guys, we see prices going lower. We see taxes going lower. We see interest rates going lower. We see, we see stuff happening with China, right? I hate to break it to you. Wars are not about right and wrong. Wars are about economy. Wars are about money. Wars are 100% are an economic stimulation activity. More money gets spent during wars than any other time. Okay, it sucks to think about and it, and it really kind of kills the whole patriotism vibe, but it's true. Um, now, if we start seeing things like interest rates going, our prices going higher, prices go up, taxes go up, interest rates go up, and we're at a time of peace, those are deflationary activities. Okay, if we start seeing deflationary activities, that means that we are in a period of inflation. Banks and governments will attempt to cause deflation because they believe the economy is stabilized by decreasing the supply of money, raising rates and slowing down spending. If this happens, it's a sign that we are in or near inflation. Okay, so guys, right now we don't see prices going up. We don't see taxes going up. We don't see rates going up. And for the most part, we've been in a time of, we, we, we've been in a time of peace. Now we're seeing more and more rumblings. So we're more in an inf inflationary activity, which means that we've been in or very close to deflation. Right. Again, it goes back to this graph we see here. So if I'm trying to predict this, I need to be looking at which ones am I seeing right now? Which ones am I seeing right now? Right now I'm seeing this. Right now I'm seeing this. Right now I'm definitely seeing this. And we're kind of still in the middle here. We're, we're not necessarily in a peacetime. We see some threats between China and, and some of these other countries. Right. But for the most part, these are inflationary activities, which means that we've been in a period of deflation most recently or very near near one. Now, the thing I want to wrap up on with this is that this is all relative, meaning. Again, deflationary does not necessarily mean that we have hit the bottom. It doesn't mean that we went all the way down. It could mean that we were way up here and we dropped a notch or two. And if we dropped a notch or two, that might feel deflationary but it doesn't mean that we hit rock bottom. There's still more room to go down. The government doesn't want that to happen. Banks don't want that to happen. So they start pumping us up with these inflationary activities, right? So as, as, a, as a citizen, as an investor, as a person, I need to really understand this because if I can wrap my mind around the simplicities and the truths here, I can understand what's around me, what should I be doing, what's happening next, I'm not in doubt at all during any of this because I know exactly where we are. I know exactly what I think is going to happen next. I can actually have some certainty there. Okay. So guys, what I want to do here is these last couple minutes, I want to open this up for questions. So if you guys are on Instagram, um, feel free to ask questions online. If you guys are on Facebook and Zoom, same thing. I'm going to open this up for questions and I want to make sure this really makes sense to you guys.
because we just covered some deep stuff. All right, Jesse Garcia has a question. He says, is silver a good hedge? Is silver a good hedge like silver American Eagles? So what Jesse is asking is, is silver a good way to protect myself from inflation? It can be, like it definitely can be from the standpoint of silver has intrinsic value. So if, if the currency goes down, dollars go down in buying power, it takes more dollars to buy the same silver. I'm going to see that reflection in buying power of my silver. So I've been, st I've been definitely stocking up in silver. Now, silver is also very volatile. So what that means is that it's going to go up and down in price. There's going to be fluctuations. So it's not like a guaranteed, hey, if I buy silver, I'm safe 100% forever and always. Um, silver just in the last two months, it was like $18, $20 an ounce early this year. It dropped down to like 12 bucks. Now it's back up around 17 again, right? So I can see some, um, some purchasing power saved and hedged with silver. I can also see some volatility there. If I'm just looking for inflation protection, I'm probably looking at gold rather than silver. Um, Lee and Chase says deep. I know, bro. I went super deep on that. Hope you guys appreciated that. Brad says, do you think we will see negative interest rates? That's an interesting question. I think we probably will. Ultimately, again, um, negative interest rates would be an inflationary activity, meaning that, that it's going to cause prices to go up. It's going to cause spending to go up. And that is a form of collectivism. And government is all about collectivism. Um, a lot of banks and corporations are as well. So I think we probably will at some point. I think there's going to be a lot of drama surrounding it. Politicians who do want it to happen, acting like they don't want it to happen just so we don't know what they're up to. But that's probably what's going to happen. Uh, James says, dude, nailed it. Thank you, James. I hope you are doing good, man. I haven't talked to you in a little bit. I hope you're doing great. James is up in um, Fairbanks, Alaska. If you guys have never been to Fairbanks, really cool place. Liam says, this is fire. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Nick says, where do you stay up on all of your knowledge about things? Um, so I just study. That's, that's what I do more than anything is I study. So I like to, there's not really a place I go. I just watch, I observe. Um, it's less for me anyways, it's less about reading other people's opinions about what's happening. It's more about what, just looking around at what actually is going on and then looking at simple scales like I covered tonight. This was not very complex and complicated. It's very simple stuff. So I like to run it through simplicity. <clears throat> Eric Whitaker says, how much money can be distributed until it can't be stopped? So what Eric is talking about would be that, that again, that, that inflationary activity of, of lots of money supply. At a certain point, this is what would happen. At a certain point, if enough money gets out and prices go high enough, the average worker won't be able to afford those things, right? So if you think about prices go up and up and up because we're printing money and printing money and loaning money and loaning money and there's lots and lots of purchasing. Just take housing, for example. Let's say housing doubles, okay? The average American would not be able to afford a house even on a mortgage at that point. So what happens is now people stop buying because they can't afford it and they become fearful. Now people are saving. That's deflationary. No one's buying housing. Housing starts to drop. So we have all this currency. We have a bunch of overinflated prices. And then we have basically nobody spending. And that's where the system cracks. Okay. Every civilization that's gone through that has failed. So that's, that's um, to answer your question, Eric, that's where it would kind of hit the point of no return. James, definitely time for a haircut. I'm, I'm down in California. So I'm, I'm true to my barber. He's in Anchorage. I haven't gone out and cheated on him yet. Um, I'm going to see how long I can hold out till I get back up. Nick says, how do we stay educated? So Nick, I have a program called Wealth Dynamics University. Um, if you, if you connect with, um, Liam, Michael Kerrigan, Eric Whitaker, any of those guys can give you information on it. Um, but that's our education program. That's where you see content like this. There's hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of educational content like this in that platform. Um, if you go to membership.jerryfetta.com, let me just throw it down in the comments for you really quick. If you go to membership.jerryfetta.com, there is a free trial of that program. Boom. So if you click on that, that's going to give you um, a free trial of our online university. You can get more information like this.
Uh, Steve says Nick Palmer get on Wealth Dynamics. Yep, Steve's correct. That's where you would go, Wealth Dynamics University. All right, let me see if there's any more questions on Facebook, then I'm going to hit up Instagram. And if you guys would like to replay this, we're going to leave it up. So you'll see it on my Facebook. You can also go to my YouTube channel. Dave, good to see you. All right, that's all I see on Facebook. Let me just check in with Instagram here. See if we have any more questions here on Insta. Uh, PK says that makes sense. It's kind of like getting alone without even knowing it. And the way to trick people to get them to, to enjoy themselves, um, to spend more money. Yep, that's true. All right, that's all I'm seeing on Instagram here. So guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. Let me just check out Zoom one last time. I want to make sure I answer all my Zoom questions. Brooke says, I love how you're making a complicated topic so easy to follow. Thank you, Brooke. I really appreciate that. That's one of my favorite things um, to be able to do for people. Nano says, military activity. Don't you call that unjustified wars? Nano, isn't every war unjustified? Uh, Nano says, is it a good idea to pay off some debt at the moment, even if one is paying low interest on the debt? That's a good question. So I would say so. Um, again, if you're looking at it from a standpoint of individualism, I would take care of my finances. I would not worry about the group. Okay, that whole go support small businesses, buy shit, you don't need to keep them in business. This might sound mean, but it wasn't my fault that they sucked at business. So I'm not going to subsidize them with my patronism if it's not actually needed, right? I'm going to focus on a home base first. I can't, just like when I get on an airplane, I can't help someone else put their mask on if mine's not on. So I'm going to pay off debt. I'm going to save money. I'm going to invest. I'm going to do me. And then because of my overabundance, I'm then, gonna, I'm then gonna go help other people. So I would definitely focus on paying debt right now. Um, Brooke says, what is the best thing I can do with the stimulus check? I love this question, Brooke. So this one is, it, it's a very um, solid answer, but it also has a great deal of irony. And that is pun intended. You'll see what I mean. I would buy metals with it. I would buy gold and silver with my stimulus check. Okay, and the reason that's ironic is because our dollar used to be backed by that. So the Federal Reserve is going to give me a bunch of free money. That's great. I'm going to go take it and buy real money, which is gold and silver. And that's why I said irony because it's metal. Hope you appreciate the humor there. Um, but that's what I would do with my stimulus check. It's not going to get me rich, but it will give me a hedge. It will give me somewhere to put that. It will be something that grows. And for a lot of people, they don't own gold and silver yet. So it's a great way to get started. Um, we have a brokerage for that. Brooke, I know you're working with Nano. You can reach out to him about this, but we have a, bull, a gold and silver bullion brokerage. Um, minimum order is like a hundred bucks. We can get you shipped out. So that would be a great place to go with the stimulus check. All right, let me just see if there's any more questions before we wrap up. I don't think so. So guys, thank you again so much for tuning in. Um, we will be back next week. I'm going to keep dropping fire like I always do. Um, I appreciate everyone tuning in. And if you have questions, reach out to me. This is something where it's two-way communication. So this is not a, a you know, join for $97 and we'll make you wealthy. It's, it's a relationship. If you work with us, we're going to work with you back. We're going to keep coaching you. We're going to keep educating you. Um, don't feel like you can't approach me on Facebook, Instagram, ask questions. I want to make sure that you're able to do that. And we have so much content out there, guys. So I hope you enjoy. I hope you have a phenomenal weekend. Um, cool. I think that's all the questions. We're going to wrap up here, guys. Great weekend. Great course. And I'll talk to you next week.